something that we've been talking about earlier this morning, right. and it's something I think you guys are going to find pretty interesting. Now, Jonathan, I'm going to ask you, when you think of building a house, list some materials that you think would be kind of typical in doing that. A little bit of brick, mm -hmm. um, plywood. Right. Mm, Maybe some stucco yeah, or something. Some, Those are occasional like yeah, down exactly. here in the south. Yeah, well, um, styrofoam, do you think of that? I do not think of no. that. No. Well, here, take a look at this house in Texas. Uh, you usually don't think of styrofoam when you think about building a house. Um, but this Texas couple did. They're using styrofoam along with concrete to build a rather unique home. This is Shannon and Lisa, and Lisa Cockrell They're using uh, styrofoam blocks to frame their 1,400 square foot home. They say it's both environmentally and economically friendly. And Jonathan, we're going to take another look at this story a little bit later to give you more information on it. But I want to know how it's going to hold up to hurricanes and tornadoes and strong winds. Exactly. You know, they're in Texas and they have a lot of tornadoes mm -hmm. in the state of Texas. And I guess as if more homes of this, uh, you know, progress along, it'd be yeah. interesting to see uh, how it takes that Mother Nature yeah. on it. We'll have yeah. to follow that. Absolutely. And Mother Nature in our area, looking at the storm tracker forecast, is showing just lots of clouds and humidity to start the day. Look at all the wet weather out of the coastal waters. Lots of lightning strikes. I've been tracking these storms all morning long across the coast. They have been weakening as they move up closer to the beaches. If you live right along the immediate coast, might have a shower this morning, but the best time in your rain will come later this afternoon for the inland areas with scattered showers and storms. Looking outside 74 to 78 to start the day out with more clouds and sun. Like I said, coastal showers to start the day and then into the afternoon. Scattered storms will be possible. Even some heavy downpours. Some areas, if you get under some of those heavy downpours, could pick up a, a quick amount of rain in a short amount of time. 86 to 90 degrees for daytime high. Some changes, though, are on the way by tomorrow. I'll be talking about those changes in the complete look at the storm tracker forecast a little bit later. Thanks, Jonathan. Well, it is a big week for many kids in the Coastal Empire. Today, they begin heading back to school. This morning, students in Appling, Brantley, Bryan, Jeff Davis, Pierce, Screven, and Ware counties are all heading back to the classroom. Of course, we wish you all a great first day back. Well, school starts Thursday in Chatham County, and because of that, first student is holding a practice bus run this morning. This is video from last year's test run. Now, the Savannah Chatham County Public School System says the practice run tests the bus schedule and gets drivers familiar with their routes. It also gives students a chance to learn the route. Now, parents are encouraged to ride along with their children, and you can find the bus schedule information on the school district's website. Samara Theodore is headed to one of the bus's uh, many stops in Chatham County to see if buses will indeed arrive on time. And some kids in our area already hitting the books again. More than 9,200 students in Bullock County went back to school Friday. Superintendent Charles Wilson says the first day of class went off without any major issues. Now these are scenes from Julia P. Bryant Elementary in Statesboro. Around 725 students are enrolled there. And students in Long and Tattano counties also went back to school Friday. Well, there doesn't seem to be an end to the violence here in Savannah. Metro Police responding to two more shootings over the weekend. The latest happening just after 7 last night in the 5200 block of Cordell Street. That's near Staley Avenue. Police say someone shot a man in his 40s. It appears to be a domestic situation. He was taken to the hospital in a private vehicle, and we talked to police on that scene. Again, there are a lot of people here. If anybody saw anything, we do need to have that information. But this one, they've, they've got some information on it now. Say the vehicle that took the victim to the hospital was actually involved in a small wreck at the corner of Cordell and Staley on their way back to the neighborhood. Well, that same day, officers also responded to another shooting on the east side of town. Metro police say a man was shot inside a business. This happened around 6 o'clock Sunday morning at 35th Street and Waters Avenue. His injuries are not life-threatening, but they are considered serious. Sunday shootings bring the count to 19 shootings in the past two and a half weeks in Savannah. Well, these come two, come two, uh, these two shootings come two days after the Friday shootings on the streets of Savannah. A person was shot Friday afternoon at East 34th and Price Streets. Officers say the victim was taken to the hospital but is expected to survive. There was another shooting earlier in the day on Greenwood Street in East Savannah. Officers say someone shot a man just after 4 a.m. And we brought this to you as breaking news right here on Good Morning or Good Day Savannah. Now that man taken to the hospital and expected to recover. Metro Police now speaking out about a possible motive for the shootings. Police say in many shootings the victims are not cooperating, which makes it hard to solve the crime. 
And as for why it's happening, we checked in with the Savannah Chatham Counter Narcotics Task Force. The agency told us they don't believe the violence is drug related. Police believe it might be people settling issues by using guns, but they don't believe these shootings are random. I'm disgusted. It's a, it's a sickening thing. Uh, the guns got to get out of the neighborhood. It's just pretty scary. I mean, this has always been my home. I was born and raised here. Um, I didn't realize that the crime was quite that bad. Police have made only one arrest so far. They released a sketch and two photos of other suspects in the shootings. And then officers are saying they need your help. If you have any information, call Crime Stoppers at 234-2020. You can also text CSTOP2020 and your tip to crimes. Now remember, callers can remain anonymous and may qualify for a cash reward. Now to Effingham County, where Guyton police continue to look into a weekend drive-by shooting. It happened around 2 o'clock Saturday morning along 7th Avenue near State Highway 17. Officers say people in as many as four vehicles shot at each other. The gunfire stretched for about a quarter mile down 7th Avenue. Nobody was hurt, but police say they found multiple pistol and rifle shell casings in the street. Officers say a box on a utility pole was damaged. A woman remains in critical condition this morning after being burned in a fire. Investigators say a natural gas buildup caused an explosion at a Wilmington Island home Friday night. Southside fire crews responded to the 600 block of Leaning Oaks Drive around 830. Neighbors heard an explosion and firefighters found the entire house on fire. Neighbors found 60-year-old Susan Glisson in the garage and helped her outside. Southside EMS later took her to the burn center in Augusta. Firefighters say she has burns on about 40% of her upper body. The gas company will return to the house to investigate. Well, nearly two dozen people are without a home this morning after a weekend apartment fire in Georgetown. And Southside fire crews say it's because of a lightning strike. WJCL's Brandon Lavornia reports on this one. Neighbors described a storm that came through the area last night like a war zone, hearing loud booms and some even felt their building shake. Here's some of the damage it left. Saturday, nearly two dozen people called this building at the Waterford Plantation Apartments home. However, Sunday morning, that all changed. A severe storm came through Georgetown. Neighbors described the sights and sounds like a war zone. We could feel our room just shake. The lightning was hitting us so hard and it just felt like it was right on top of us. Well, it was just a lot of lightning and a lot of thunder, a lot of very loud thunder. Some had no idea just how much damage the lightning caused around 2 a.m. Uh, until we woke up this morning, got ready for church to leave out, and we seen ambulances and fire trucks parked out here and we noticed the building had been on fire. Mary and James Moore almost moved into this apartment. She can't believe what it looks like now after fire crews say lightning started a fire in the attic, spreading through the walls, eventually engulfing the second floor. 18 adults and three children lost their home in the fire. It's heart sickening. It's devastating. And my heart goes out to these families. I can't even imagine what they all must be going through. Neither can Richard Satterfield. He lives right next door to the unit where some of his friends lived. Satterfield is happy that none of the residents were injured as he witnessed nearly three dozen firefighters try to save the building. You know, I'm not too concerned about how the building is, just, just uh, the heartache that people are going through. Right now, American Red Cross volunteers are helping many of the 21 people that were displaced by the fire here in Georgetown last night. Those in the community are hoping people can just come together and become stronger through all of this. Putting them up for a few days, they said, but uh, I don't know what they're going to do. They're, they're, you know, they were crying about their two cats. This is the second major fire in Georgetown in the last 12 months. In December, a unit from the Crown Villa Apartments was also destroyed by a fire. In the studio, I'm Brandon Lavornia for WJCL News, working for you. Red Cross volunteers have given the families comfort kits and money for food, shelter, medicine, and clothing. And we've been seeing lots of lightning strikes this morning on Storm Tracker Live radar all morning long out over the coastal areas, out over the ocean this morning, seeing those storms and pushing up closer to the eastern parts of Beaufort County, even in one little lightning strike there over Beaufort. But we are seeing the bulk of the heavy rain staying east of our area. And I expect that trend to continue throughout much of the morning. But if you live right along the media coast, some of the beaches, you'll probably may see a shower, even some heavy downpours as we go throughout the first part of the morning. But that'll be spreading inland once we head into the afternoon with all the heat and humidity around. We'll probably 
see a few thunderstorms later today as well. By the morning, 30% chance for showers and storms in the afternoon at noon today, 84. The best time in rain today will come probably anywhere between lunchtime up to about 8 o'clock this evening. And you see those temperatures down below average, only upper 80s for daytime highs. So we'll track our seven day forecast after we get through today. I was talking about some changes. How about less chances for rain for Tuesday, Wednesday, and also for Thursday? May still have an isolated thunderstorm in the afternoon, but most spots dry as we go into the middle of the week. However, you know there's a little difference. You don't have the rain, but you're going to have the hot and humid conditions. 94 degrees for Wednesday and Thursday, and there's that weekend forecast with scattered storms in the afternoon highs in the lower 90s. So heat and humidity, Cassidy, will be uh, returning, going back up above average by Wednesday. So bad hair, day, hair days continue. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the humidity. Oh, you have bad hair days. Humidity is going to be high all the way through uh, September. All right. Maybe early October. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, Jonathan. <laughs> Coming up on Good Day Savannah, Procter & Gamble dropping nearly half of its brands. Find out which ones they're holding on to a little later in the show. But first, hundreds of thousands in Toledo, Ohio are still unable to drink or even cook with tap water. Details on that coming up next in your national news. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Good Day Savannah. Time now is 713. We begin this morning with national news in California. That's where the state's governor has declared a state of emergency because of a rash of wildfires. Well, the declaration was made Saturday. Thousands of acres of land have burned in several northern California counties. The declaration allows the state to mobilize the National Guard for disaster relief. Now, the governor's office says as of Friday, there were 17 fires burning throughout the state, including one that crossed into California from Oregon. A contaminated water supply leaves hundreds of thousands of people unable to use their faucets. Well, overnight, the mayor of Toledo, Ohio, decided not to lift water restrictions. Andrew Spencer reports. Volunteers outside Waite High School handed out case after case of bottled water. National Guard troops also set up stations where people could fill buckets and jugs from huge tanks of purified water. These were about the only options, as as many as 400,000 people had to stop using their tap water when officials realized late Friday that the water supply had been contaminated. You're used to having a water all the time, and it's something that you're used to, and you just can't have it. Blooms of algae in Lake Erie create a toxin called microcystin. With the algae thriving, that toxin enters Toledo's water supply. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration says the toxin can cause nausea and potentially acute liver failure. The tainted water created another problem for hospitals in Toledo. All weekend we've only been doing emergency surgeries and the issue isn't the surgery itself, it's the instrumentation that's used in the surgery. Um, a big surgical case could have uh, seven trays of instruments that need to be sterilized. Many of those instruments had to be shipped to hospitals outside the area for sterilization. In most of Toledo, the levels of microcystin had dropped to what is considered a safe level by Sunday night, but overnight, the mayor still wasn't ready to lift the water restrictions. I am not going to isolate part of the city, so therefore, I've instructed our people to go resample and retest. 
because I am not going to take any chances with this community's well-being and health. I'm Andrew Spencer reporting. Now to New Jersey, where an exploding vat of eggnog flavoring injured two workers at a chemical plant Saturday night. The fire marshal said he actually felt the explosion at Pharmachem Laboratories in his house a mile away. Now, Pharmachem produces ingredients that flavor foods. Investigators say workers had just gotten started on a new recipe for eggnog when it somehow ignited. The fire marshal says half of the building may have to be torn down. The cause is still being looked into. Well, coming up right here on Good Day Savannah, with only a couple of days left before school starts here in Chatham County, we have a live interview on all you need to know about immunization requirements this school year. Stay with us for that story. In consumer news this morning, Procter & Gamble cleaning house. The nation's largest consumer product company plans to dump about 90 of its smaller, less popular brands. The move still leaving the company with a portfolio of 70 to 80 brands. Now P&G will continue to sell some of their best known products found in American households, including Tide laundry detergent, Charmin toilet paper, Gillette razors, Pampers diapers, Crest toothpaste, and Bounty paper towels. There's no word on whether the move could affect jobs at the company. Well, Kodak is getting a big helping hand from the A-list in Hollywood to extend the life of motion picture film. The Eastman Kodak Company is currently the only major company that still produces movie film, and it's all but finalized the deal. Kodak emerged from Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in September and said it would keep making movie film as long as it was profitable. But sales have dropped a whopping 96 percent since 2006, because studios, well, they've moved to digital recording. A group of leading directors pushed studio heads to negotiate with, with Kodak to keep producing that film. Well, in Texas, a prayer service for another doctor battling the deadly Ebola virus. Father, we need to cry out to you this week on behalf of our brother Kent and on behalf of his family. Members of the Abilene community gathered at Southern Hills Church Sunday to pray for Dr. Kent Brantley. Brantley contracted Ebola while on a humanitarian mission in West Africa. He's now in Atlanta, where he's being treated for that virus. A family friend read a statement from the doctor's family to the congregation, saying they are humbled by the worldwide response and that they believe he will be healed. All right, Jonathan. You know, we had a lot of rain over the weekend, and I know we said we needed it, but I think we're all ready for a little break. What's going on coming up? Hey, yeah, you know, a good break, uh, Cassie, this morning. Not a whole lot of rain for everyone that's headed out okay. to school this morning. You know, a lot of schools first day is starting for many areas. And looking outside on live radar, not seeing a whole lot of rain over land, but look at all the wet weather out of the coastal water. Seeing that uh, for the beaches this morning, just east of Tybee and Beaufort, been seeing some lightning strikes. A bus stop forecast as we start the day out. We're seeing temperatures running into the low to mid 70s in many areas. Scattered showers and storms, but the best chance for rain today will probably 
probably come after about two or three o'clock. So it may see those storms firing up once school lets out later this afternoon and highs for today about 88 degrees will top things off. So much of the morning should be pretty much rain free for most spots as you start in your first day of school. Storm tracker seven day forecast after we get through today, we'll begin to see things really warm up feeling like summertime by Wednesday and Thursday afternoon highs will be into the mid 90s. You're watching Good Day Savannah here on Fox 28. Time now is 721. We'll be right back after the break. Come on with me. me. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we're just, you know, I'll start, um, you know, welcoming you and everything and um, just say, you know, we're just days away from school starting um, and, you know, where a lot of people forget about, are, which side am I on this side? Um, that's Right. Welcome back to Good Day Savannah. Well guys, believe it or not, it's time for a new school year to begin. And that means that shots and immunizations for a lot of kids heading back to school. And this year it means some new news for kids heading into the seventh grade. And we have a very special guest joining me this morning to tell us all about it. Coastal Health District Immunization Coordinator, Jocelyn Hall. Jocelyn, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We Thanks really appreciate having, it. Thanks for having Cassidy. Well, I, you know, I think when we start back to school, we mm -hmm. all think of back to school shopping, you know, getting those new clothes, supplies, right. doing all kinds of those things to prepare for the school year. But immunizations are a vital part of preparing for each school year. Is that right? Yes, it is. And this year we have the new seventh grade requirements, mm -hmm. uh, meningococcal and Tdap vaccines mm -hmm. are required for seventh graders and new entrants into eighth through twelfth grade this year. Okay, so that wasn't a requirement previously then? It was always recommended by the CDC, but this year Georgia made a requirement for seventh graders. Okay, and so what does that mean if, if someone going into the seventh grade hasn't had those immunizations? If you have not had them, you may not be, be able to attend school this year. Wow. Yes. So it's really important to make sure that all, all parents um, know about that for sure. Now, um, I know that what, and it's protecting them. These immunizations really protecting them against what now? Men meningitis mm -hmm. and also the Tdap is tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. Okay. And pertussis, as we know, has been on the rise, so mm -hmm. we want to get those to protect everyone. Of course. And uh, then also you guys are recommending, and this is not required, but recommending another vaccine. Tell me a little bit about that. Yes, the HPV vaccine uh, is also recommended for 11 to 12-year-olds, and it 
prevents cancer. So ask your health care provider about that vaccine. Okay. All right. Yeah, I feel like we hear a lot about that. You see the television commercials about the HPV vaccine and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, but And you guys are really encouraging that for kids of what age? 11 to 12 year olds before, before you... Just in that kind of adolescent yes. time frame. Yes. And then you, it can go all the way up to 26 years old, is that yes. right? Yes, yes. Okay, so really important shots and immunizations, things like that. Now, tell parents out there if they're watching and they're saying, oh my goodness, my seventh grader or my child does not have the proper immunizations, what's the best thing they can do at this point? What, what do they need to do today? Parents, you can take your children to your pediatrician or visit your local health department. Okay. All right. A lot of great information. We really appreciate you joining us here this morning to tell us all about these really important uh, immunizations and parents out there, you know, get out there and get your kids in to get immunized if they have not been done already. Jocelyn Hall, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you, Cassie. We really appreciate it. Best of luck for you guys getting ready for the school yes. year. <laughs> parents and kids, best of luck for you guys out there as well. The time is now 727. Straight ahead, your top stories. And Jonathan has your storm tracker forecast coming up next on Good Day Savannah. Stick with us.